So thanks a lot for, uh, for, for having me this morning. Uh, it's great to be with you. Uh, I'm going to give you a slightly random talk. I'm going to talk about a few different things, mostly share some ideas, talk a bit about the company, um, and hopefully just plant some seeds. Uh, because this, today's really about you guys, um, and it's about uh, you growing to, to really make a difference in the world of technology. Um, so with that, we'll get going. So when I was a student, um, the world looked a little bit different. It was very cool to wear uh, baggy t-shirts and checked shorts. These are shorts, by the way, not trousers. Um, and uh, and combat, combat trousers, obviously, was cool as well. Um, and mobile phones looked a little bit different. So uh, th this was actually rather more advanced than my first mobile phone. But, but just raise your hand if you used to have a device like this. Yeah, you're older than I thought. <laughs> um, but then in, in 2007, the first iPhone was launched, and that really heralded the start of the smartphone revolution. And as we know, uh, there have been a number of real milestones in that, obviously the launch of Android a few years later. And if you look at, the, at the, uh, the way smartphones have exploded around the world, it's quite phenomenal. Growth faster than, than any form of technology in, in the past by an order of magnitude. So in 2008, um, my friend John and I, uh, we were students together at Cambridge, um, we had an idea. And our idea was really that there were these amazing devices, these, these smartphones, but people were really struggling to type on them. And the kind of technology that was in use for, for helping people to type was largely an evolution from these types of devices. But actually, the smartphone was much more powerful uh, than anything that had come before. It was really much more like having a kind of mini computer in your hand rather than just an, an evolution of a feature phone. Um, so we, we thought it must be possible to do something, something better, something more advanced in terms of helping people to type. Um, so these photos, this is, uh, this is my co-founder, John. This was actually on our first sales trip, so, so fast forwarding a little bit. And this was me uh, on my Christmas holiday uh, writing the first patent for our company um, in 2009. And that's a, sort of, that's a, a real world example of the metaphor of eating lion's testicles. Um, so, so we had this idea. And we felt like we had sort of a, a one in a thousand shot of actually doing anything because our vision was to build some technology that we could license to some of the biggest companies in the world. Um, so companies like Samsung. And you know, we were just a couple of guys with this idea. So if you fast forward a few years, um, this, this is our keyboard that we built. It's for Android here. We actually just launched on iOS last week. Um, and we're now about 160 staff, headquarters in London. We've got offices in San Francisco, Seoul, and uh, Beijing and Tokyo. I think we've got like one guy in each, so. Um, and the technology is embedded now on, on more than 250 million devices worldwide. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about what that technology is and how we built it. But first off, I want to give you uh, some ideas, really. So, so the, the field that I studied in um, is, is called natural language processing. And it's kind of a, it's, it's a, a subfield of artificial intelligence. And for me, natural language processing means the application of ideas from machine learning to tasks that involve human languages. So I want to give you a bit of background. Um, to this area and why I think it's, it's exciting to be in, in this space and, and doing building stuff in AI. So one of the most fascinating questions that we can ask as human beings is how do we think? The brain, as far as we know, is, is the most complex organism in the known universe. Um, and as engineers, the question that, that, that is probably most fascinating for us is how do we model how we think. 
And that's a pretty interesting question because you're using your brain to think about how the brain works. Um, so of all the questions you can ask, I think this is one of the most fascinating. And the human brain is, is utterly remarkable. So the, the density of, of connections in the human brain is still thousands of times higher than our fastest supercomputers. And that's before you take into account the plasticity of the brain, so the ability that it has to morph and change. Um, <clears throat> when we think about the brain, we, we, we kind of divide thought processes into two, two areas, subconscious and conscious. Um, so human thought is a complex blend of these two processes, uh, conscious that we're aware of and the subconscious that we're not. And traditionally, software engineering has been driven by models of conscious thought. And the study of the subconscious has traditionally been left to psychology. And this is, of course, Sigmund Freud. So when we think about building models of conscious thought, um, this is kind of natural for us, because by definition, conscious thought is, is the process of which we're aware. So when we think about how we model how we think, traditionally, we've thought about how you model conscious thought. And the type of architecture that virtually all modern computing is based on was designed by this guy, uh, John von Neumann. And it has a number of properties that reflect conscious human thought. And I picked out three here. It's logical. So the whole of our, of our modern computing is based on logic gates constructed from transistors. It's sequential. What that means is one thing happens after another. So one of the, one of the things that's happened recently in computing is, is we've got a lot more interested in parallelizing things. But still, fundamentally, parallelism in modern computing is a series of sequential processes sort of stacked up running tasks in parallel. But fundamentally, it's still sequential. And the other thing is it's debuggable. So that means you can stop a CPU at any point. You can look into it. You can look at the registers. And you can work out exactly what's happened. You can follow the flow of information. This makes it a lot easier to debug. So what about subconscious thought? <clears throat> so subconscious thought uh, is based on a number of different properties that are quite different to, to conscious thought. It's based on abstraction. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is uh, there, are, there are multiple layers that you're not aware of. So when I look at a face, the first thing that happens is the, the photons fall onto my retina. Um, and then my brain starts to pick out features. And then it turns those features into edges. And then it turns those edges into objects. And then it turns those objects into recognizable facial features, eyes, mouth, nose. And then it takes those, and it composes a face. So the, each one of these is a layer of abstraction. Subconscious thought deals with uncertainty all the time. Um, so whenever you, whenever you do anything, like trying to climb a flight of stairs, for instance, your brain is essentially dealing with the fact that it can't be absolutely certain what the outcome is going to be. So it starts to predict what, what, where your foot should probably land in order to maintain your balance. Another good example I like to use is if somebody throws a ball at you, um, your brain can't compute where the ball's going to land. It has to deal with the fact that, to start with, there's a great deal of uncertainty. So what it does is it, it, it models what it knows. So if somebody stands at the back and throws a ball at me, <coughs> the first thing I know is that it's coming in this direction. I don't really know where it's going to land. As the ball gets closer and closer, my brain is consistently refining a hypothesis about where the ball's going to land. And as it gets closer and closer and closer, I move my hands, catch it, and then at the moment the ball lands in my palms, then there's no uncertainty. But up until that point, I'm constantly refining these hypotheses that deal with the fact that the world is uncertain. And inference, inference is that cycle of, of guessing. The brain is a prediction machine. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the history of artificial intelligence. 
<clears throat> so in the 50s and 60s, when people started thinking about AI, when this, this phrase was coined, um, mostly people were thinking about robots. And they thought that we'd essentially be able to build robots by modeling conscious thoughts and then sort of embedding it in, in some kind of autonomous device. And people thought about robots that would help out around the home or drive cars and things. And a lot of the predictions are very optimistic, you know, sort of within 20 or 30 years, we'd be able to build these things. Um, but it turns out that the real world is far, far more complex than we might have hoped. And building robots that are based on these models of conscious thought <clears throat> just doesn't really scale. So people spent quite a long time building artificial worlds where you'd, you'd construct a robot that was able to manipulate blocks, for instance. And the concept was, if we could understand how to represent these simple words, simple worlds using, uh, using symbolic logic, as we call it, then we'd be able to scale that up, and ultimately, we'd end up with a robot that could do the ironing. Um, but that's not true, because the problem with these models is they don't represent uncertainty. They don't deal with the fact that the world is way too complex to know enough about it to be certain about anything, in fact. So if you're going to build something that deals with the real world, you're going to have to deal with uncertainty. So how do you do that? Well, people started to realize that there are some tools in mathematics that are very good at dealing with uncertainty. And probability theory is one of the foremost. So this is uh, the Reverend Thomas Bayes here on the left. And he came up with this simple theorem here, which is called Bayes' theorem. Who's heard of Bayes' theorem? Wow, nice. OK. Great, I'm preaching to the choir. Um, and this is George Boole, who, who wrote various uh, fascinating books, none of which I've actually read. Um, <clears throat> but laying out how you can model human thought as a series of hypotheses using the laws of probability theory. And there's a lot of theory. You know, th this, this stuff was developed um, a, lot, a very long time ago, way before computers were able to, to help us. Um, but more recently, we've been able to take uh, ideas from the fields of, for instance, statistics and machine learning, and implement real models that use probability theory. So statistics is about co the collection of data, and then coming up with hypotheses and proving those hypotheses using the data. And machine learning is also about starting with data, and then we build a model, and then we do inference on that and make predictions. <laughs> And natural language processing, as I was saying earlier, is the application of these ideas, ideas from machine learning, um, to problems that involve human languages. And for me, this was the particular area that I focused my own study on when I was at university. OK. Matt, how long have I got? Uh, you've got another 15 minutes. Ages. OK. <clears throat> right, I'll spin this out. <coughs> Just kidding. OK, so <clears throat> I want to talk to you about uh, the company that I co-founded, SwiftKey. But I'm not really going to talk too much about, uh, about the business side. I'm going to talk about the technology that we built and how we went about building it. So <clears throat> we were thinking about the problem of typing. And what we wanted to do was to come up with a mathematical way of characterizing what it means to, to type. Typing, we could kind of see, was going to be this massive thing. Um, and with the explosion of smartphones, we could see that people were going to be not just using their phones for, for sending text messages and uh, speaking to each other, but also for using Facebook and sending email and tweeting and, and so on and so forth. And so we could see that, that people were going to be doing a lot of typing. We wanted to make this easier. So how, how do we think about this problem? Well, we, we came up with a way of characterizing typing using the language of probability theory. 
And it's pretty simple as a concept. The idea is that when we're typing, we have a sequence in our mind, a sequence of language, um, which we'll call S. And there's some evidence that, that will help the, the model to work out what it is that, that we're trying to say. And there's a, there's a model that, or a series of models that we're going to use um, to make that inference. So we, if, we want to solve, if, if we can solve this equation, then we'd be, at, we'd be doing great at typing. Because the thing about typing is it's not really about keyboards. It's about language, but how you, how you capture and predict the way people use language. So imagine that, um, that I could look at all of the sequences, which unfortunately is an infinite number, but let's imagine that it's possible to do that. Um, and if, if I could draw a probability distribution over all of these, then all I'd have to do for any individual in any situation is pick uh, the sequence that had the highest probability. Um, and if, if I was able to solve this sort of really well, then maybe I could get close to being able to predict at any moment what someone was, was li most likely to say next. Um, and if I could do that with sufficient accuracy, then maybe we could change typing into something a little bit different. Now, the problem is uh, it's actually pretty hard to solve that expression with very high accuracy. In fact, it's extremely hard because um, the ambiguity of, of language and the the, uh, creative, the creativity of, um, of thought processes and the things we say, obviously, is, is extremely high. Um, but what we can do with that expression, then, is break it down into a number of subcomponents. And I'm just obviously not, not really showing you any derivations here. I'm just showing you some, some sort of meta maths. <clears throat> but what we did was to break down this central expression into a number of different components. So we, we thought about uh, the context and characterizing that as everything that you've, that you've said so far in, in a message, let's say. And then the input is the thing that you're trying to say at the moment. Um, and then we model these in a different way. And then the prior sort of helps us to understand, without any evidence about, about what, you've, what you've typed, um, what is most likely. And what, what's really interesting about this is that what I've listed down the bottom here are different functions. So any virtual keyboard um, will have similar types of, of features to this. But what happens now is that the features flow from the mathematics rather than starting with a feature set and building it from scratch. And the reason why this is important is that if you have a model like this, then you have a, a a motivated way of knowing if you're improving on the core problem that you're trying to solve, rather than just kind of groping around in the dark and trying to build something better. Um, but to make, to make these, these machine learning models work, you need a lot of data. So we knew that if we were going to build something that was able to, to do this prediction, um, and, and by the way, that this doesn't just mean predicting in advance what someone's going to say. It also means, given the things that you've typed, the areas that you've tapped on the touchscreen, predicting what it is you actually meant to say. So it covers both autocorrect, prediction, correction, but various things that you'll be familiar with as users of smartphones. But we needed a lot of data. So we, we set about on a project to scrape uh, all of the publicly available text off the internet. Um, and we used a portion of the European grid to do this. And the reason I've, I've shown you the LHC is because um, the European grid was put together to analyze the data that came off the LHC. And the LHC kept breaking down, because I, I think people kept leaving sandwiches in it or something. Um, and so we actually had access to, to the grid for, um, oh, hi, Ollie. I see you there. Ollie, Ollie's been working with us for the last year or so. Um, year, six months? Six months, gosh, seems like longer. Um, so yeah, we, we used uh, the European grid to gather a lot of data to train these models. And, um, and that formed the, the, the heart of what we were doing. But the real insight that we'd had, um, actually coming from some research that I'd done in the early 2000s on spam filtering, was that the, the way to build, the way to instantiate this mathematical model that I talked about 
in a really effective way was to combine models. So you took one model that was based on billions of words of English, and you took another model that was based just on the language that you've created um, as, as a user. And with these two probabilistic models, you can then combine them. Um, so this is what you're seeing here. The, the, the way the software works is that we take all these words that we scraped off uh, the internet, and we take input on, on, the, on an individual's language from their social profiles, things like uh, Facebook and Gmail, Twitter. Um, and then we pull these things together, and that creates the, these, this algorithm that is able to instantiate the, ma the mass that I showed you on the first slide. I can see guys at the front sort of fanning themselves. It is pretty hot in here. I think I've already taken off as many clothes as I can, um, but if the worst comes to the worst. The conditioning is now about to apparently ramp up. I've just been texting today, so. Great. We're working on okay. it. Okay. Probably leave the T-shirt on then. Um, so, so I talked about the, the language side. And in, in, in that equation that I showed you here, uh, this context bit is instantiated through a language model. But this input bit here is instantiated through a geometric model. Um, and the ge geometric model basically uh, uses probability distributions across the surface of the keyboard to model where a user is tapping. Um, and you can visualize these models in, 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 in two dimensions. And the, the bright areas are where the probability is highest. So if you were to turn this over, you can imagine it would look like a mountain range. With, with the higher peaks representing higher probabilities. And you can see how this evolves um, in, in somebody who types in, in a, let's say, more sloppy way. So this is, a, this is a, a visual representation of the way somebody actually perceives the keyboard. Um, so you can see, in this case, um, they're consistently typing just sort of below the keys. And the software adapts. Every time, you, every time you, you tap on the screen, it retrains the models. And these probability distributions are shifting around. Um, so we, we launched uh, our first, well, we, we built this prototype of the engine um, in 2009. And we realized that it's really hard to sell something if you don't have a product to demo it. So we built this keyboard that we called SwiftKey. Um, and we launched it on Android in 2010. And off the back of the consumer response to that, we were then able to license to various, various companies, including uh, Samsung and Sony. So if you use a Samsung phone, you're, you're using this technology. It sits behind the keyboard. And obviously, also, if you've downloaded either of our apps, we just launched an iOS. Um, with iOS 8, they've opened up the keyboard framework. So it's pretty exciting. So for the first time, uh, we're able to really have a cross-platform proposition. So this means that the insights that, that sit in those models, we're now able to share these across multiple platforms. Um, so the iOS launch was, was great. We had a million downloads in uh, just under, under the first day, which was the, the best launch we'd ever had. So I'm just going to share some, some numbers, a bit more businessy. Um, so Overall, in, in terms of the app, so this is not the embedded technology in, in Samsung phones, for instance, or Sony phones, but it's, it's just people who've downloaded the app have typed just over 6 trillion characters. Um, and this 1.5 trillion keystrokes saved is the, the amount of, of keystrokes that we save by predicting in advance what it is that you're most likely to say. And this represents, oh, interesting, <laughs> OK. This represents uh, something like 10,000 years of typing, if you were, to, uh, if you were to, to compute it like that. Um, so what does the future look like for us? Um, well, this is our kind of marketing speak. Um, what are we trying to do? We're trying to make it easy for everyone to create and communicate on mobile. So that's pretty broad. You know, We could do lots of things with that. Um, so the things we care about are building new products. So we're interested particularly in how, uh, how the keyboard interacts with different applications across the device, whether we can build uh, a tighter integration. One, one concrete idea there is that 
if we're able to sync more closely with a messaging app, then, then we would know who it is you're trying to write to, and then we could tailor the maths to that particular individual. So it's sort of a, a, a two-way personalization. Um, we're really focused on growing our user base, particularly we have, a, we have an enormous user base from the, the embedded technology in, in devices, but we're particularly interested in growing the user base around people who actually use our application and know that it's, it's the SwiftKey keyboard. And finally, we're really, really proud to be a UK technology company. There aren't, there aren't enough software companies in the consumer space in the UK. And I would encourage all of you to think about what contribution can you make. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>